We are with Cheryl Schaefer. Um, she's a pharmacist at the River Heights Fort Gary My Health team. She's going to be talking to us about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and we were kind of joking off camera, so to speak, that there's so much information coming and changing so fast. It's um, a real challenge to kind of stay on top of it. So hopefully a lot of your questions and concerns are answered tonight. If you are joining us, make sure your mic is muted and we'll use the chat box for questions. I am going to pass this over to Cheryl. I am going to mute myself and I will tune back in as soon as your presentation is over and I'll help you with the questions. So have a great talk. Hi everybody, thanks for um, logging in tonight. I'm excited to present um, and talk to you guys about this. This is a, a little bit of a passion project. I um, want to help address any questions, concerns, hesitancy that's out there. So um, let's dive right into the COVID vaccines and what our options are. Okay, so Ria kind of went through most of this. So I, I'll, I think I'll just um, skip over just our housekeeping rules. So just as uh, she stated, keep your mic on mute, um, raise your hand or just enter the questions in the chat function and we'll address them at the end because we could be addressing them as the presentation goes on. Um, and then just a just gen general disclaimer um, that um, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to just address basic questions, concerns, to provide you just factual information um, to help you make a decision as far as whether you want to um, get the COVID vaccine at some point in time or when you qualify. Um, and this is just not a general debate of vaccines. So just to be mindful of that, be respectful um, and mindful of those that are joining and um, that this is information that people are seeking. So who am I? As Rhea, Rhea was nice enough to introduce me. I am Cheryl. I'm a pharmacist with the River Heights Fork Area My Health Team. So it's a program that is run through Manitoba Health and WHA. I work with um, specific clinics in the River Heights for Gary area um, and I'm out of the access center. We also work with a lot of community partners and refit is one of them. So that's why I'm presenting here today. Um, I graduated from the University of Manitoba in 2007 and I also have been working in pediatric ICU and adult dialysis throughout my career. So COVID-19, it's been quite the year. It's about been about a year now since our, our first case and our initial sort of lockdowns and restrictions came in. Um, so what does that meant for Manitoba? Um, as of February 23rd, we know that we've had over 31,000 cases. Of those cases, over 2,200 of those ended up in hospital. And the, the average length of stay was about 17 days. Of those people who were admitted to hospital, over 400 of those needed some kind of intensive care support. Um, and the average stay in that was about nine days. And as of that, February 23rd, we had 886 cases, uh, um, fatalities or deaths due to COVID-19. Um, obviously that's been a bit more since um, the last couple of weeks. For reference, um, you can see this little graph. The reason I just included, it's not to overwhelm anybody, but basically the blue bars are the number of cases and the red bars are the number of people in hospital at any time. So the impact of this is to just show that, you know, even as our cases fell down, those that were in hospital often needed hospital for a long time. So the domino effect that happens because of these cases is not just the restrictions that we're seeing in stores and, you know, who we're allowed to see socially, it's also what resources had to be redirected within the healthcare system to support that long impact in the hospitals. Because while the cases fell down in the community, what was being needing to be managed in the hospital lasted a long time. So that's something sometimes we forget. Um, to just compare that to anything else, um, influenza every year, so the flu, um, death rate is far lower. We've only, from 2015 to the start of um, the 2020 season, um, there were only 131 recorded deaths. So you can see that COVID has had a huge impact on um, Manitoba and the world. And just also for reference, our code red has been in place since November 12th. Okay, so, you know, most, no, most of us, we understand those risks, right? You know, um, but we have questions. At the end of the day, we wanna know what will stop this in the end? How do we get to the, 
to the end of the, the road. Um, you know, when will some of these restrictions be lifted? Um, I'm tired of wearing a mask. I want to see my friends and family. Um, you know, you know, explain to me why vaccines are the best exit from this. You know, it, they, they came out so fast. Is that okay? Were they rushed? Are they safe? There's a lot of information and that's what we're here to answer today. So how do we stop or slow COVID? So you may have heard in the news or, or just, you know, through people talking, this word called herd immunity. What does that mean? Herd immunity is basically a level of, of basically the number of people that we need a certain level of protection for the population so that we can lift restrictions. Um, and that way, moving forward, even if there's a, a case of COVID here or there, we're not worried that it's going to spread through the, through the community very fast. How do we get to herd immunity? Well, two ways. We can either get there with disease-related immunity. Some people call this natural immunity. And that is essentially getting COVID and then building your own immunity for it. The other option is using vaccine immunity, which is getting the vaccine. So again, what does really disease-related immunity mean? What is the impact of that? Is it safe to do? So what you need is you need people to get sick. How you build the immunity is you get sick and then you have the protection from your immune system. That protection is also though not reliable. It's not consistent person to person. It can depend on how, you know, did you have mild COVID? Did you have severe COVID? What are your own health conditions? The, the risk of that is that you could end up, even if you are a survivor, you could end up with what we call long haul COVID, which is ongoing weeks and months of headaches, fatigue or exhaustion, shortness of breath. Um, there's quite a few things people are, are talking about that they're having. How do we get there? Or what would we need if we were going to rely on only natural or disease related immunity? Um, if you take Manitoba's average population with a goal of 65% protected, um, you would need 650 cases a day for three years. And as we can recall back in October, November, we were having 300 to 400 cases and our hospitals were becoming overwhelmed and we were shutting down elective procedures. Um, and obviously as a result, this little pie graph here is just showing us that we would need quite a lot of people to get sick. And the only other alternative would be that some people would, would pass away because of COVID. The alternative then is vaccine immunity. So that's when people get a, a vaccine. The result is usually a protection from our immune system that is more reliable and it's often stronger because it's built while we're healthy, not while we're sick. It spreads, slows the spread of the virus because we then become protected. We you know, can't get sick. So if we can't get sick, can we give it to somebody else? It also will get into the topic of variants a little bit further into this talk, but basically if a virus isn't spreading, it can't change, it can't mutate, it can't become a variant. Our restrictions can get looser sooner. And then obviously based on this little pie graph I included here, you can see most people will get the vaccine. Maybe a few might get sick, but they will probably not get as sick. And then unfortunately, yes, there still might be a few people who pass away, um, but the numbers will be far less. So how do vaccines work? Um, they basically work to teach our immune system what to do. They play a little bit of a game of show and tell. They say, here, look at this. This is what I need you to recognize and I need you to learn to protect yourself from it. Or as I tell my six-year-old daughter, you're, you're teaching your ninjas what to do. So the immune system then builds a memory and then that way if it sees the real infection, it goes, no, you don't belong here. We're gonna attack you. So for the COVID vaccines, what they're working on, um, what they all have in common is that they are trying to teach the immune system to recognize that little spike protein that's on top of the coronavirus. And this is what that looks like. So you can see here, there is um, this, this is the coronavirus. And you can see this is the spike protein. And the reason it's important is because that spike protein is how that coronavirus is attaching to our own host cells. So whether that's in the lungs, the nose, the throat, 
or once it gets stronger, it gets throughout your body, people will have heart con um, complications. So this is why this little spike protein becomes so important. So the vaccines we're gonna go through are the mRNA vaccines, which is the Moderna and the Pfizer, the AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson, which is what we call viral vector. And then I won't touch on it too much, it's not approved yet, but there's a Novavax vaccine. I put it in here just because it was in the news um, that it's gonna be manufactured here um, in the future um, out of a plant in, in Montreal. So this is just a closer look at the different types of vaccines. So now we're lucky enough in Canada, we have four approved vaccines. So we have again, the mRNA, the viral vector, AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson, and then hopefully down the road, the Novavax. So these are kind of giving you a picture idea of what they look like. So mRNA vaccines um, made by Pfizer and Moderna, they are two doses and they are preservative free. So a lot of people sometimes come up to ask me, well, they're so new, you know, is, is that okay? Well, in reality, even something I learned over the last few months is that these mRNA vaccines were actually been, have been in research for over th almost 30 years now. They have been in development for um, other possible vaccines such as rabies or Zika virus. If anybody travels down south, um, that was a concern um, for anyone expecting to get pregnant that they shouldn't travel to the Caribbean and some southern countries. Um, it's also been in development for possible cancer treatments. So what is it and how does it kind of work? So as you can see in this little picture, it's essentially a fat bubble and inside is something called mRNA. mRNA is a recipe, basically a recipe that our body uses to build proteins. So we have them in our own body. It's how our body knows how to make more, to grow our hair. Hair is a protein and it uses, um, our body uses the mRNA to build the recipe to make hair. So what this does is it gets into our body and this mRNA is the recipe for that spike protein. It goes into our cells, our cells make that spike protein and then our immune system learns to attack it. The reason these were first to market is because they're very quick to, to make in the lab. Um, reassuring pieces again, it's not an actual virus. Um, they've already are starting to make newer versions to help with some of these variants, which again, we'll talk about in a few minutes. And there's also no preservatives. That comes to the next question that a lot of people have. So why do they need to be stored on ice or in these big sub-zero freezers? And that's essentially because um, they have no preservatives and that fat bubble and the mRNA itself are both very fragile and they need to be kept frozen until being used. And they're also, have to be they're very delicate so they can't be shaken or dropped and that's why these vaccines are being used and delivered at these super sites such as the convention center um, and other options will be available at doctor's offices and pharmacies because they're just too delicate to to put into a um to to send off into so many locations and not to be reassured that the dose is given at room temperature the other two vaccines that are, are being rolled out and will be available very soon, um, I've, I've heard sometime from some locations uh, possibly as early as next week. So we have the AstraZeneca, which is two doses, and the Johnson Johnson, which right now is only one dose. And these are stored in the fridge, so these are a little bit easier to send off. So these are the ones that will be found in doctor's offices and community pharmacies. They're less fragile than the mRNA vaccines. So again, that's why it'll be easier to deliver. And how do these ones work? You can see it's, what it is, is basically same idea as the mRNA ones. It's a dead inactivated virus shell, essentially. And then inside that shell is the mRNA. So same idea that dead virus shell carries it into the body tells or shows the mRNA to your, your cells or your body, your body makes the spike protein and then your immune system learns to attack it. But that shell is just a little bit more stable and that's why it can keep um, at the fridge or in the fridge. Um, and so again, reassuring that, you know, is this a new technology? Is this, it's basically, this was the, the approach that the Ebola vaccine 
um, was that helped that they developed a few years ago when there, um, Ebola was there was the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Um, so last, I won't get into this too much because it's not available yet, but the last one that could be available um, in the coming months in Canada is the Novavax vaccine. Um, it's called a sub viral subunit protein. So basically it's got a little bit of the same idea as the other two, but in that it's an empty fat bubble and then they put a, a pretend spike protein on the outside. And so basically this floats around in the body and the your immune system recognizes as this foreign body with this spike and it'll start to attack um, and build immunity for it. So again, it's um, not approved. So it's not one that we'll focus on too much today. So overall, the big question is, and a question I'm getting a lot now that we have four, of, soon to have four available, and um, is, should I get the AstraZeneca? Should I get wait, hold out to the Pfizer Moderna? Which one do I qualify for? And it, like, how do they compare? Because um, a lot of talk is around, so to speak, the, um, oh, well, AstraZeneca is only 62.5% effective, or um, the Johnson Johnson was, you know, only 57% effective. And I understand that that can be super concerning. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to remember a few key points. So the Moderna and the Pfizer, um, they, because they were first to market, they finished all of their studies back in the fall before any of these variants, which again, we'll talk about right away, came about. Johnson Johnson and AstraZeneca were finishing their studies a little bit later, and they were running their studies in countries that had a lot of COVID, which included the United Kingdom and South Africa. So those numbers are actually real reflection of um, their protection against the variants. So the fact that they are a little bit lower is still okay. Where it comes in more important is that across the board, all of these options are 100% um, offered 100% protection from hospitalization or severe COVID, um, and that they all reduced if people got COVID, they were very mild. Now, overall, these studies will that number of 100% hospitalization protection might you know, start to be a little bit less than 100% with time, because as you start vaccinating millions upon millions of people, there might be the odd person who got vaccinated who might end up in hospital. However, um, those numbers will be dramatically less than what we have been seeing. But across the board, these vaccines were equal when it came to severe COVID, which is typically for most of them meant if you got COVID and had more three or more symptoms. So that COVID, severe COVID could also have still been just a runny nose, a sore throat, and maybe a bit of a headache. Um, so for the most part, across the board, they are equal when it comes to the concerning factors that we're worried about. So again, I basically summed this up already um, to kind of give you some context as far as, you know, are we how does this stand up against the flu shot? Year to year, the flu shot is, we guess we are estimating, anywhere between 45 to 60% effective against um, getting influenza at all. So really when you pull that number against even the viral vectors, those are still coming out more effective than the, even the flu shot that most of us get year to year. So again, those numbers are really good across the board and these can't really be compared apples to apples because the mRNA vaccines were run so far ahead before those variants were around. So again, what are these variants and why do we need to care? Um, so basically when viruses are spreading, they are going to change or mutate as they move and they multiply in your body. Where it becomes a concern is where they start to mutate or change in a way that makes them stronger. Either they make them more, it makes them more infectious, they can spread more easily or faster. And that's for COVID-19 what we're watching because we know how it attaches to the body is that little spike protein. And obviously the higher number of cases we have, the more chances that virus has to change and get stronger. Um, 
And if it, that happens, then we need stronger public health measures. And we're already starting to see that in that even here, we the contact tracers who are calling people who have COVID are actually now saying, I need the names of anybody who you've been in contact for 10 minutes rather than 15, like they were saying before. So again, this is why vaccination becomes really important, because if we can get vaccines in arms ahead of our variants reaching the community, um, then we will limit that the chance of those variants becoming even stronger. So again, just stressing again, do these vaccines work against the variant? As of right now, we actually know that AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson do have some benefit against those variants because their studies were run in those countries that where they were happening. Um, mRNA vaccines were run they were did their studies before. They've run some lab information. They they think that their protection is a little bit less, but we don't have real world information yet to know. But to be proactive, they're already developing a booster that should protect from the variant. So um, the nature of the mRNA vaccines allows them to move quicker. And that should real world results start to show that those who are vaccinated might not are getting COVID more easily. And then it would become kind of like a booster like we do every year with influenza. Okay, so another question I get is, you know, but it feels like they were approved really fast. Should I be concerned? And that is a valid question. Even I was sort of like, wow, this has really, you know, come up really fast. But then I did some digging and I, and I, I had to learn. Okay, so what usually happens when a drug is being approved is someone goes into research and they have to go and not only get approved for research, they have to get money for that research. And that can take time, months or years. They go through one step of the research. Okay, that result had good results. Okay, great. Now we have to move on to the second. Again, get approval, get money. Now you can move into the next step and so on and so forth. And each of those steps can take years. And that's only if you actually find something that's successful. So when it, what happened with COVID is because everyone was super concerned and it was having such a huge impact on our social life, on the economy, on healthcare, there were a lot of people willing to give up money and throw money at the researchers that they knew, knew or already had the templates or the building blocks to possibly make a vaccine. So you saw money being thrown at every single step of the research phase. So as soon as the step one of the clinical studies to see if the vaccine was working showed that it was working, there was no hesitation. That money was already sitting there so that they could move on to the next step. The other thing too that made it easy to approve and easy to research is COVID was everywhere. So it wasn't hard to put a vaccine in an arm in a few thousand arms and know that it was getting, that those people were not getting COVID when the people who didn't get the vaccines were getting COVID. Um, when you compare that to say the shingles vaccine, that one took a really long time, but the nature of shingles is that you also have to give the vaccine and then watch people for 20 years to see do they get shingles or not? And if they do, do they at least get it more mild than someone who didn't get the vaccine? So the nature of COVID allowed things to move a lot faster than say other vaccines that have um, come out in recent history. Okay, so I decided to get my vaccine. What can I expect? So for the most part, you're gonna get your pretty typical vaccine reactions. If you've gotten a flu shot or any other, you know, even tetanus shot in, in the last few years, um, it's pretty mild. You might have a little bit of soreness on your arm. You might have redness or a bit of swelling. You might feel a bit of what people call flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, headache, joint pain, maybe a bit of muscle pain. This is normal. This is it's going to feel flu-like because your immune system is trying to build that response, that protection um, for a true infection. They last about a day or two. If you get those symptoms, can you treat them? By all means, we just recommend you don't treat ahead of time. So if you've got your, you know, your, your schedule for your, your appointment for your vaccine on this day at this time, don't pop a Tylenol or an Advil as you're walking in get the vaccine, let you yourself see how your body adjusts. Full disclosure, I got my first dose the other week and I ended up 
okay other than a bit of a sore heavy arm. So the need for medication wasn't even there. Um, so we just recommend that for any vaccine, to be honest, is that you wait until the symptoms come on, then take something to support the symptoms. And if you're unsure what you can take just because of your medication or your health condition, again, by all means, plug to the pharmacist, always ask. What about severe reactions? Those are often concerns for a lot of people. On average, um, severe reactions in general are about one in 200,000 people. So those reactions we're talking about a really itchy rash at the site, um, a shoulder injury from you know, the needle itself. Um, we are seeing with some of the COVID vaccines, the swollen lymph node in the armpit area. Um, these tend to last um, a, like a couple of weeks. Um, it's still recommended to get it checked out, but they, again, usually are minor and um, can be managed with, with medical help. Anaphylaxis is always another reaction that we're always concerned about and a lot of people can be worried about. That's an extreme allergic reaction that is basically swelling of the throat and mouth and tongue that makes it difficult to breathe. Um, this is what sort of anyone with a nut allergy or egg allergy might experience. The rough um, occurrence or how often this happens in any vaccine is about one in one million. Um, Slightly at this rate, a little bit more common with the mRNA, they're saying about two in one million. Um, but again, that number seems to be diluting out the more people that get it. It's completely treatable. And again, all vac anyone who is a vaccine site needs to be equipped with the rescue therapy to, to treat an anaphylaxis. Um, to give you a comparison to what everyday risks that we take, um, Dying in a car crash is one in 106 if, you're, if you drive every day. Being struck by lightning is one in 3,000 in your lifetime. So, you know, when you compare that on the whole, it, it, it puts it into a little bit more context. Of course, a lot, some of these things will look like they're happening more often, but right now we're, we're vaccinating worldwide millions of millions of people a day. You're going to see a few things that happen and that would normally happen in society, but because vaccines are happening at the same time, it's hard to detach what, what caused what. So I always tell people correlation is not causation. So just because something happens doesn't mean that something that also happened that day is the cause of it. Um, so most of these are two doses. Why is that? Um, that is mostly because of the way our natural immune system works. Again, the Johnson Johnson right now is one vaccine, um, one dose, um, but they are, I think, considering or have put in the request to run another um, study where if they gave a second dose, would they get a little bit better response? Um, so what is the reason for the two doses essentially um, is that basically with the first dose, we get a little bit of an immune response where our body makes a little bit of spike protein. And that's usually when we, we build our short-term memory for our immune system. But the second dose is what our, where our long-term memory immune system kicks in and we get a little bit better recognition of that spike protein. So that's sort of why right now, most of them are two doses. Where a lot of stuff is coming up with how far apart do we separate them? Um, that's just more looking at as we gather information from other countries who are a bit ahead of us with our vaccinations, their vaccinations, we're learning to see that, you know, even these ones that were, that said only one month apart, um, some of those questions, our countries did delay it a little bit. And they found that if they delayed, they still were okay. So um, that's sort of where some of the recommendations came in to start stretching them out a little bit more, but we don't want to stretch it too far that that first um, immune response that we build comes down to zero and then we have to start over again. So it's a delicate balance. Okay, so what if I had COVID? Do I need to get vaccinated? And the answer is yes. Um, right now, and as I said in that um, earlier in the presentation, we don't know person to person how good of an immune response or immune protection you built because of your COVID infection. Um, some people we find had really strong and some people not so much. Um, so the vaccine will give people that guaranteed protection. Um, and again, your 
own immune response was probably more not related to the variants. So knowing that the vaccines have some protection against the variants will ensure that you are protected if COVID continues to evolve a little bit. Um, there is possible talk that maybe people with COVID only need one dose, but that, that information is still in the very, very new stages. So for right now, we are recommending that even if you had COVID, you still plan that you will get two doses. If I get vaccinated, will I still need to wear a mask? Right now, um, we, we are, the rules are saying that yes, even if you're vaccinated, you should be wearing a mask around other people. Um, for the most part, the information coming in is saying that it looks like if you're vaccinated, not only are you protecting yourself from COVID, but you are protecting yourself from acting as what we call carrier. That means you have COVID, but you have no symptoms. So you go about your day, but you could spread it to somebody else. So until we're at a point where enough of us in Manitoba or Canada are protected with the vaccine to know that, um, one, we're not carrying the, the virus, and two, that even if we are a little bit, we're not sharing it with someone vulnerable who could get sick really easily. We're saying, let's keep wearing the masks um, and keep physical distancing just to keep us safe till we're at closer to herd immunity. Um, so what if I am someone who, you know, is part of the special group where I should talk to somebody? So um, there were a few groups of people that weren't included in some of the studies for the vaccines. Um, so usually this is just more because when we are studying a drug and we want to get it approved quick, we want to keep the group of people looking as close to the same as to each other as possible. So we usually don't want people, we don't include people who have, who are pregnant or breastfeeding, since obviously that there's also ethical issues there. People with autoimmune disorders, so that would be like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, uh, fibromyalgia, um, just to name a, f a couple. Um, I think even maybe type 1 diabetes might have been not included. Immunocompromised would be anyone who's had a like organ transplant, um, people who are on chemotherapy or stronger um, um, medications that are that make you more prone to infections. It's not that these vaccines are unsafe in these groups. It's just that they weren't studied. And but we are still recommending that people in these groups get the vaccine and talk to your doctor about it because chances are the risk of COVID is far greater than um, the risks of the vaccine. And really, it's not that there's risks with the vaccine for these people. It's more that um, we just want to know, make sure people understand that they may not have the same response um, that is being advertised as far as like the Moderna and the Pfizer being 95% effective is your immune response might be a little bit weaker than say someone who is otherwise healthy and that's okay. Um, it's still better to have some protection than none. And obviously children and teenagers haven't been included in any of the studies. Um, so they will be phased in slowly as we have more safety data. And there is one trial with teenagers in the States out of, um, with Pfizer. So hopefully we'll have some information for our, our teenagers soon. Okay, so say after all of this, you know, you you still decide you want to wait, and that's okay. It's it's your decision. The, the some things that I do suggest um, to kind of consider um, while you're waiting is um, set some some boundaries or some some timelines or specifics of what you're waiting for. Decide what it is that you're waiting for. Are you waiting to see how you know someone you know get it and see how they react and get more hands-on, um, more close contact experience? Um, do you want just more safety information? Do you want, you know, figure out what that, that limitation is or what that, um, that end point is, is that what you want to wait for and, do, and decide how long are you going to wait for that information? Um, decide how in the meantime, will you prevent COVID for yourself or another? Um, and think about how long you would, you know, that you want to live with some of the restrictions um, and think about the risks of putting off the vaccine. Um, and then in the meantime, be willing to learn, unlearn, relearn, seek out the proper information to answer those questions. So say, for example, it's, well, you know, these studies are new and, you know, I, I don't have enough information if it's safe. 
you know, one answer back could be, well, some of these clinical studies actually started back in like March and April of last year. MR, the mRNA vaccines were were their first set of trials or their first set of studies started in March and April of last year. So we do have a bit of information already. So again, it's just about setting those guidelines as to what you're waiting for and how are you going to uh, make your decisions moving forward. The other thing to be very aware of is um, to be social media and media savvy. Um, there's a lot of information out, out there, a lot of clickbait articles, people saying this or that, and it's hard to know where um, everyone stands and what information is real. So if you're on the internet, know that websites that end in .gov, .org, or .edu are regulated sites, so they will have information that is credible and researched. Um, know when the original posting or published date is. A lot of people, especially on social media, share articles that are actually, when you dive into them, they're maybe like a year out of date. Also take a look at the source. Are they trustworthy? Do they, do, does the author list all of their references and resources that they use to gather their information? And are those references credible and um, properly researched? Who is posting the information? What are their credentials? If you're on Instagram or Facebook, um, you know, and you're following somebody, you know, if you reach out to them and ask them, like, what is your your medical background? Can they share that with them with you? Um, and then consider to what you're sharing and how that might affect other people. So if you're sharing something that might be pr like pro or like like pro, you know, waiting or you know a certain media article, you know, just be mindful of how it might affect others and how impressionable um, others may be to, to information. Um, and because there's a lot of gray information out there. So it's just important to be wary of how people might be interpreting it. So again, when in doubt, if you're not sure if it's truthful or fact, then I usually recommend don't share it and, and talk to somebody before if you have any questions. So again, reliable information. Um, there's the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. That's our national um, guideline uh, organization. There's the Public Health Agency of Canada has resources. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The government of Manitoba has a lot of fact sheets. I mean, I'll admit they're very wordy, but the information's there. And then again, you can always talk to your healthcare team. And with that, we'll take questions. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. That no was a, I will honestly say I learned probably more than I have in a normal presentation. There was so much information and I, I think every question that I had, like the next slide answered it. So it was great in that way. It was really laid out. You anticipated all of my questions. So if anybody else had that experience, um, I would not be shocked. I think she did an excellent job and answered all our questions. But if you do have a burning question that maybe didn't get covered, um, that's kind of appropriate for the conversation, feel free to use the chat box on the bottom. Um, I think it's a lot of food for thought right now and a lot to process. I know everybody's at a different stage of thinking of um, if and when and which vaccine to get and all those parameters. And maybe you're not thinking of yourself, but maybe you're thinking of loved ones and how we approach that situation. And, and I think everybody's just hoping that this works and we get back to some sense of normalcy. So. Yeah. And yeah, again, I'll stress that the best vaccine is the one that you can get first. So whatever you qualify for, um, don't, I don't recommend every and every credible person I follow, whether, you know, I'll, full disclosure, I follow people on Instagram. It's all take what you can get. Mm -hmm. It's more important to get some protection. It's better to say, get the AstraZeneca um, now. And then if we, you know, a year from now realize there's still some spatterings of COVID and, you know, a booster mRNA is going to be the better option to like moving forward, that will be made available. So to get, to kind of put a halt and hopefully get us closer to normalcy is getting what you can get, like what's available to you. And I know that there's a lot of confusion too around, um, like because of the AstraZeneca recommendations for it being under 65. So I know I already had some questions today around um, like, so how, like when will people who are like above 65, but still under 80, like what are they gonna get? So as of right now, to my understanding, they will eventually get the Moderna or the Pfizer um, pending that the Johnson & Johnson supply. 
Um, but Johnson & Johnson was okay over 65. So unless the NACI, which is the National Advisory Board, comes out with different recommendations, um, chances are that that might open up um, it a little bit faster for that kind of gapped age range. Okay, the question, um... I meant to say vaccinated people at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> um, if vaccinated people, I guess, can they, can they pass the virus on to other people? So that if I'm a young, healthy person, uh, not worried about my health outcome with COVID, how do I know getting the vaccine is protecting others? So yeah, so as of right now, we're getting more and more information that yes, the, if you're vaccinated, um, it's likely that you're you're less likely to carry it um, to a more vulnerable loved one. And again, you know, even those who think that they, you know, aren't so that they aren't so worried about their outcomes from COVID, because yes, most people, you know, in the younger age range have had mostly mild reactions. However, that tends to be though, when you talk about these long haulers, they tend to be people in their 20s, 30s and 40s who have ongoing weeks and months of headaches and fatigue and shortness of breath. Um, so keeping in mind that there are pieces of that puzzle in protecting yourself um, for those long haul risks. Um, but yes, we do um, have some good information and we're getting better information as it goes um, that at least in say Israel where they are um, really far ahead on their vaccination campaign that um, they're seeing a dramatic drop in a what we call asymptomatic cases so that's where people are not having symptoms but still carrying and testing positive for COVID so they are seeing a drop in those um, so chances are that yes when we get it's just a harder end point to measure when you're running a clinical study to because you would literally have to test people every three to five days to see if they're carrying COVID without symptoms um, so but we're we know that the flu shot prevents us from carrying it and then too with the COVID vaccines we're seeing that if people aren't sick. Um, and even if they are carrying COVID a little bit, they're carrying so little of it, they're not likely to spread it. Um, so I would say that that should be hopefully a reassuring and motivating um, factor for people. Um, the AstraZeneca one, for sure, they did track the carrying capacity and they did have, um, I don't remember sir, off the top of my head, the exact percentage, but they did have a good impact on not carrying COVID. Good. Thanks. A great answer. Does anybody else have a question um, or comment? Otherwise, we will call it an evening soon. And again, thank you for doing this. I know she came into work to make sure she uh, had a good space to do her presentation. We were chatting about this new norm and doing presentations at home with children and such and, and the, the challenges in that. So thanks very much for doing that and taking your time. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Our next presentation is next Wednesday. Um, I forgot all my papers at work, but it'll be on Instagram and Facebook. So we will remind you of the topic and I will see you next week. Have a great week and enjoy the weather as it gets warm. And again, thanks Cheryl, it was great meeting you. No problem. If people have other questions after, you can always email them to me and I can type them out and you guys can post them. For sure. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. No problem. Thank you, everyone.